Today we're going to look at the stories of a group of warriors from uh, World War II. Um, I think you're going to enjoy the stories. They involve one instance where a uh, one of the soldiers took out an entire machine gun nest in a battle in Italy and uh, was received a uh, Purple Heart and a Silver Star on the field of battle, only to have that metal taking those medals taken away through due to a technicality. We're also going to see the stories of a cute little girl who made her, her mark in the war. The title of this, this chapter in Warrior is Andy, Chips, and Smokey. To your right there is that little girl I was talking about. She is a Yorkie. Her name was Smokey. Uh, she made her mark in her, uh, there were books written about her and some other things done after the war that I think you'll find quite delightful. So we're going to start with the story of Andy. On November 14th of 1943, Andy, you see him on the left, he's the Doberman Pinscher, uh, led a scouting mission into enemy territory at Bougainville. Now Bougainville is in the South Pacific, very close to the Solomon Islands, um, and near Papua New Guinea um, in the South Pacific. The, uh, those people that were around Andy um, referred to him as Gentleman Jim because he was an aristocratic um, dog and uh, held some aloofness and demeanor that uh, was just noticeable. He looked like a gentleman there. Uh, at Bougainville, Privates Robert Lansy and John Mahoney took them out to, to scout an enemy strong point. As the three moved beyond the enemy lines into heavy foliage, Andy, about 25 yards out front, stopped short, looked to the left and the right, uh, signaling to his handlers that something was going on. So the two soldiers crept up along the trail behind Andy and saw two machine gun nests, one on each side of the trail. The two handlers started shooting. Lansley threw two grenades, and it was all over eight Japanese soldiers were dead. The wiping out of the machine gun nests by Andy and the two handlers permitted that entire sector of the line to move forward. Then we're going to talk about the story of Chips. Now Chips is the one who received the Silver Star, the Distinguished Service Cross, and the Purple Heart for his heroic actions during the invasion of Sicily in 1942. The only problem with those awards was he happened to be a five-year-old German Shepherd Collie Siberian Husky mix, and Army policy prohibited the official commendation of animals, so his medals were taken away. Um, the way Chips got into the war, uh, he was a resident of Pleasantville, New York, and his uh, owners donated him to the war effort, and he was sent to uh, dog war dog training school in Port Royal, Virginia. And during the invasion of Sicily, Chips broke free from his handler on the beach and ran towards a machine gun fire that was pinning down Allied service members. Chips attacked a hidden gun nest, biting German soldiers and pulling a smoking machine gun from its base. According to uh, this Private John Rowell's account, of the uh, raid, Chips grabbed one of the Germans by the neck and dragged him from the pillbox. And his comrades followed with their hands up. Chips was injured in the battle, but Chips was truly a hero. And Chips later gained notoriety for the other things that he had done during the war, including he, a public meeting that he had with General Eisenhower in 1945. And during that time, General Eisenhower was recognizing him for his service, and General Eisenhower bent down <clears throat> to thank him for his bravery. Chips bit him. Chips had been trained to clamp down on humans that he did not know, and he did not know General Eisenhower. But Chips died seven months after he returned home to New York. Um, his obituary stated that his family sent him into military service because he had bitten a garbage collector. Chips was truly a warrior. 
And finally, we're going to talk about Smokey. Smokey was a Yorkie, and she saw action in the Pacific during World War II. Now, she was not a trained uh, service animal for World War II. She, uh, she was a stray um, living on the islands of, of New Guinea and uh, found abandoned. She was a, uh, more or less adopted as a, uh, as a pet a mascot for the troops there but then they started noticing that she was actually going to be of service to them uh, with all of the uh, air raids and all the battles that had gone on around them Smokey had a keen sense of what was going on and she was able to warn others when incoming artillery shells were coming in so she would recognize that and she would uh, alert the rest of the troops and they would take cover uh, and she saved a lot of lives by doing that um, again she's not like most service animals in the war most of the animals were german shepherds and doberman pinchers but Smokey was a little yorkie but this tiny girl was a veteran of tough conditions she had already survived as a stray on that island she had dealt with the uh, weather conditions the heat the humidity uh, the difficulties around there so she was very much uh, not just a little pretty face they had a situation in the Luzon campaign where they needed to pull some some phone wires under a uh, taxi strip at the airway and uh, the problem was that it was going to take many hours to do it and they were going to have to dig under the, the concrete to do it um in order to um in order to protect us against uh destruction by enemy bombings um but instead of a three-day digging task to bury the wire smoky went through a 70 foot eight inch pipe with four inch sand piles that filtered down at each of the four feet segment in the drainage culvert smoky carried the lines through a 70 foot pipe she had never done this before her handlers asked her to and she performed that's a picture of her after the war receiving an, an award she she gained some notoriety there were some films made about her some stories written about her um, and the final one we're going to talk about is caesar he was also wounded at bougainville um, he was a German Shepherd and he was trained as a messenger dog assigned to two handlers because the location radio communication was not possible so messenger dogs were trained to take messages to the front lines communication to the leaders on the front lines Caesar made nine trips delivering messages under heavy enemy fire the dog team this is a quote dog teams were sleeping when Caesar heard a sound which woke him Mayo reacted to the movement of his dog in time to see a hand grenade drop at their feet. The soldier was able to throw the device back in the direction that it came from. The next morning, eight Japanese were discovered where Mayo had hurled the grenade. The messenger dogs <clears throat> were very vital to the, to the war effort, and mostly they were spent their time in the Pacific Theater. The sentry dogs were uh, used to be patrol uh, on a short leash with a firm hand. They were lookout dogs. They were supposed to give warning by not growling or barking. Um, they were especially valuable when working in the dark or when attack from uh, the rear was most likely. Um, more than 90% of the dogs trained for World War II, and there were 10,475 dogs used. More than 90% of them were trained as sentries. The messenger dogs were trained to carry medical supplies and messages and ammunition from one handler to another while avoiding all men and other distractions. They were subjected to overhead rifle and machine gun fire, explosions, charges of dynamite and TNT to simulate actual battlefield conditions. They were warned not, they were uh, trained not to be distracted by those types of things. They were trained 
um, not to be gun shy and to still carry out the The scout dog was especially trained to work in silence to aid in the detection of snipers, ambushes, and other enemy forces uh, within the area. They were trained to warn without barking. This was something that nobody expected them to be able to do. They were told that during the training process, there's no way you can train a dog not to bark when they sense danger. But they were trained to warn by nudging their handler, by nudging their their fellow warrior um, of the danger without having to bark. And it was very hard to train these types of dogs because they had to be have very intelligent. They had to have a quiet disposition. Um, and for this reason, the scout dog was able to take the point in most combat uh, patrols well in front of the infantry patrol. The scout dog was very valuable in the war. And you see the picture over there on the right. That's a, another dobe that uh, served as a scout dog. Although dogs had been used in the wars for centuries, no formal program had been created until 1943 when the Doberman Pincher Doberman Club of America offered to help with war efforts. They were not well received. They were laughed at. A lot of the handlers were barked at by people. Uh, they just made fun of them <clears throat> as they were going through the training process because they did not see how any way for those dogs to be effective in the war. But when they got into the war, the dogs proved themselves to be valuable. Dogs were trained to warn without barking. Dogs were trained to carry messengers, supplies, um, and even in some cases, to attack on enemy, enemy positions. More than 10,000 dogs served in World War II. Many were true heroes. In all, 29 dogs were listed as KIA in World War II. The primary role of the Dobes, the Ships, the Labs, and other breeds who served in World War II was to protect their soldiers on the field. Remember, Andy wasn't even a purebred. Andy was a mixed breed with a, with a little bit of Shep and a little bit of Husky in him. When we talk about spiritual warfare, we talk about biblical discipleship. We are talking about a time when we are under constant attacks from the world, the flesh, and the devil. We're called to stay alert, but God has equipped us with a spiritual bro brotherhood that is designed to help us engage those battles. When you look at the things that these dogs did during the war, they were they were there to support the soldier that they were assigned to. Uh, the soldier was not going into battle alone. They had a brotherhood, brotherhood of other soldiers, but in this case, they also had the brotherhood of a dog who was trained to take care of them. John Wesley said, there's nothing more unchristian than a solitary Christian. We're not, we're not designed to battle spiritual warfare on our own. We're not meant to do that. Christ has called us to be dependent on each other. And Tozer said, when men boast of being self-sufficient, they are indulging in a fiction that can be proven fictitious by just taking a quick look around. You know, we, we live in a country where being self-sufficient, being John Wayne or Clint Eastwood-esque is is to be commended and we want to stand up and be a man and uh, pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Uh, we don't like the idea of being dependent on someone else. But Tozer says, when you boast of being self-sufficient, you're just kidding yourself. We're not self-sufficient. I'm not self-sufficient. So when we go into discipleship training, you see on the right there, the picture of the dobe he's he's awake the soldier's asleep the soldier couldn't sleep in that foxhole without the the dobe standing by to watch after him to look over him to warn him if there's something coming gives him the peace of being able to sleep during the battle 
when we talk about the word relational accountability, it, it comes across sometimes as a Christian buzzword. Um, we like to use the word, but very few of us actually practice it. We have common spirit, group of spiritual enemies. We have to recognize the fact that Rambo was a fictional character, not a true hero. Clint Eastwood, uh, Bruce Willis diving off the building and showing all his heroism. Those are fictional characters. John Wayne coming across the, the fields in True Grit with his uh, reins in his mouth and two guns firing and blazing. The real heroes in this life, the real heroes are people who are open and transparent with their fellow warriors and their faith. I don't go to my brother and tell him I've got it all together. I don't go to my brother and say, I've, I've got all the answers. I don't need your help. If I'm a true warrior, if I'm a true warrior for Christ, I'm going to look at my friend and I say, I can't do this. I need you to stand with me. And you need me to stand with you. That's what relational accountability is all about. We use the relationships that will help mold our character and protect us from spiritual vulnerability. Again, go back to that picture of the uh, soldier there in the, in the pit. Um, we can't be on the alert at all times. Sometimes we let our guards down. Sometimes we go to sleep. Having that brother stand guard over us is a picture of dependency. This soldier's dependent on that dobe right there. But stay close to a friend you cannot con. Stay close to a friend who loves you well enough to tell you when you're screwing up. Stay close to a friend who will never violate a confidence, one whose primary ways the enemy keeps a guy from finishing strong is isolation. Instead of following Christ, you begin to act like you are a Christian. Think about those words. Get close to someone that's going to see through it when you tell them you got it all together. Tell us, be close to a friend who's willing to look you in the eye and say, you're out of line. I'm not saying this to put judgment on you. I'm telling you as a friend, because I love you, you're out of line. And I want you to know that you're you're putting yourself at risk, whatever that risk might be. Satan wants us to be independent. Satan wants us to think we're like John Wayne running across that field. Instead, all we're doing is acting like we're followers of Christ. Christ wants us to be dependent. We go back to uh, Amos 5 and we look at what happened with Amos. Amos uh, had a message for the people of, of Israel and to specifically to Jeroboam. Uh, Israel was in, in um, a time of rebellion and defiance. And Amos, who is not, he, he, he said he wasn't a prophet, um, but he was a prophet because God equipped him that way. But he went to Jeroboam and told Jeroboam what he did not want to hear. He says, seek the Lord, Jeroboam, lest he break out like a fire in the house of Joseph and devour it with none to quench it for Bethel. Amos came to Jeroboam to send him a message. Amos came with a warning and an opportunity for Jeroboam to see the danger ahead. And he goes on in verse 11, he says, because you trample on the poor, you exact taxes of grain from him. You have built houses hewn of stone but you do not dwell in them you have planted pleasant vineyards but you do not drink their wine for i know how many your transgressions are and how great your sins are you who afflict the righteous who take a bribe turn aside the needy at the gate he's speaking to someone who could put him to death and he finishes he says this is what he showed me, this is what God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with the plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? Amos said, I see a plumb line. He said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel, that I will never pass again, again pass by them. 
The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuary of Israel shall be laid to waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. I don't know how many people today understand what a plumb line is, but a plumb line, essentially, it works like a string with a weight on the end of it. Um, when you are setting a house, when you are uh, setting a structure and you want it to be perfectly vertical, you hold the plumb line against the structure, against that frame of the house or the frame of the structure. And you, you look at the gap between the line and the structure, and you can tell if it's listing to the left or to the right or to the back or to the front. That plumb line is God's commands for Israel. It's God's direction for Israel. And he's saying, I put this plumb line up, and you, Israel, do not measure. But the priest, Amaziah, priest of, uh, who was uh, the priest under Jeroboam, Boam, Instead of taking the warning, he came back and said, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all of his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And here's Amaziah's, or Amaziah's response to Amos. Instead of saying, I've heard your warnings, I've heard your message, I've heard what we're about to go through and we want to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. We want to measure up to this. No, he didn't say any of that. He looked at Amos and said, get out of here. O seer, flee away to the land of Judah, but never again prophesy at Bethel. For this is the king's sanctuary. It's the temple of the kingdom. You know, we live in a time where um, we have a lot of prosperity messages going on in the pulpits and we have a lot of people that believe that God is going to bless us uh, because we're entitled to that blessing. Uh, we have we live in a time where people don't embrace the idea or the concept of the, of the reality that we are under spiritual warfare and that Satan is attacking the world's attacking. So we have these prosperity preachers saying for all of you people who are talking about sin and hell all you people who are talking about repentance and turning back to God, we don't want you. You need to come in here and tell, like we are saying, we are fortunate, we are, um, we are entitled to this, we are going to be healthy, wealthy, and even if it's not just the health and wealth pastors, it's also still a belief among a lot of mainline denominations, a lot, a lot of mainline religions that man is basically good and everything's going to be lovely in this life if you turn to Christ. Amos was acting as the messenger. Amos was acting in a manner that should have caught the attention of Jeroboam. But Jeroboam rejected the warnings of not only Amos, but other prophets. And Israel soon fell under the captivity of Assyria. And Amos's words in Amos 9, Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the surface of the ground, except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, declares the war. Jeroboam and Amaziah had no reason saw no reason to respond to the warnings. Their pride and position in the world left them to the point where they did not feel vulnerable. They didn't think they needed anyone to tell them this. But yet in the message of Amos, even though it's a message of destruction, notice the, the promise inside of that. God had made a covenant with Israel. God's covenant was going to endure forever. And no matter what the rebellion was like, he said, I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob. And we see through all the rebellion that Israel went through and all the rebellion that Judah went through, God continued to protect a seed that would eventually lead us to Christ. Because he did not, he did not violate his own promise, even though uh, Israel rejected him. And the same is true for us today. As Christians, we can reject Christ. We can walk away from Christ. We can take it on ourselves. 
to uh, ignore the warnings of a friend or the warnings of Scripture. God has, will be true to his promises because of his covenant and not because of my faithfulness. This little fellow on the left is Sergeant Stubby. I don't really know much about Sergeant Stubby's story, but you, it's clear that he has a medal around his neck. and So he must have done something neat, but it's a, I thought it was a cute picture. Um, pastor George Swinnick, a Pur Puritan writer, Puritan pastor. Um, his quote is, Satan watches for those vessels that sail without a convoy. If you think about the idea of First um, Peter, where he talks about Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And you picture that back, go back to the days of Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom or something on the National Geographic Channel. Oftentimes the, the lion is waiting around for an animal that, that doesn't keep up with the herd. That's the easiest target, the wildebeest. The, uh, the wildebeest that's partially lame or is moving slower than the others makes it very easy for the lion to come and devour them. Um, we're created for community. Isolation is the devil's playground. So if we choose to go it alone, we have, we have Christian brothers who can walk with us and who should be our lookout and we should be their lookout. If we decide to go it alone, what uh, Pastor Swinnick is telling us that we that Satan is on the lookout for us because he can take us down fairly easily. We need the accountability, the fellowship and encouragement of other faithful brothers and sisters. Amaziah was 25 years old. Now this is not the prophet Amaziah. This is the king Amaziah. When he became to reign uh, in Jerusalem and he did right in the eyes of the Lord yet not with a whole heart now one of the things you see in uh, the history of Israel and Judah is that Israel had no good kings uh, when they the northern ten tribes uh, went their own way and and went pretty quickly into uh, um, captivity because they never had a king that led them with, uh, in the in the way that God had called them to walk. Uh, you did see some good and some partially good kings in, in the kingdom of Judah, and Amaziah was one of those. He did right in the eyes of the Lord, but not with a whole heart. So he didn't do everything he was supposed to do. He was the king of Judah, but he decided to enlist 100,000 men from Ephraim, and that, that is the northern tribe, northern ten tribes. And Amaziah gave him response and said, um, O king, do not let the army of Israel go with you, for the Lord is not with Israel. He's not with these Ephraimites, but go and be strong for the battle. Now, Amaziah, Amaziah heeded the warning of the man, and he was victorious, but he also took um, so, ran into some problems with uh, Israel because he had enlisted them and then pushed them back. But in the immediate aftermath of his victory, after listening to the encouragement of someone who saw the danger, the next frame, he succumbs to his own pride. Then the, the same man confronted him a second time. This time he pushed him away instead of engaging in what the man had called him to do. He started worshiping idols. He worshiped the idols he had captured and attempted to create another alliance with Ephraim after he was warned not to do. So Amaziah, on the first hand, he did the warning on the second opportunity. He decided he was too good for that, didn't need the help, um, did what he was told not to do, and he was defeated. You have the same type of thing when you talk about David in this confrontation with Goliath. Goliath. Um, Jonathan was David's friend, but he was also heir to the throne. And it says that David and Jonathan became very close friends in spite of the fact that David had been anointed to take his father's place 
Jonathan showed his loyalty to David. And he says, as soon as he was finished speaking with Saul, the, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. Jonathan committed himself to David. We have relationships in our own lives. We have friendships other Christians who are willing to stand with us. Jonathan's commitment was a covenant, covenant because of how much he loved him. He was willing to do what he needed to do. And there was times when he would use that friendship to warn David and other times when he would use that friendship to support and encourage David. That's part of what we are when we're, we're in a Christian fellowship. So when Saul started going after David, his jealous rage incited him to, to attack David, Jonathan defied his father. He went to David with a warning. This is a pretty amazing thing. It's a, it's a powerful act of love for a man like Jonathan to defy his father who was the king. And instead of doing what the king said, he went out of his way to protect David with a warning. So Saul spoke to Jonathan and put everybody together and said they needed to kill David. But Jonathan wouldn't do it. So he went to David. He said, Saul, my father seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning. Stay in the secret place and hide yourself. I will go out and stand by my father in the field where you are, and I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. So David, Jonathan now has warned David to stay out of sight to not be killed by Saul. And now he's interceding against his father's wishes. He says, I'm going to speak to my father. And I'm going to see if I can change his mind. So Jonathan went to uh, Saul. Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because you, his deeds have brought good to you. He took his life in your hand. In his hand, and he struck down the Philistine. The Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why will you then sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul relented. He said, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. But this didn't permanently turn Saul's feelings about David. His, his jealousy just continued to rage. And he risked, David, Jonathan risked his life again a second time and actually sacrificed his position in the kingdom. And when Saul learned that David had protected him and warned him again, that, I'm sorry, Jonathan had protected David and warned him again, he got angry. And this is what he said to his own son. You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, I, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. It's all saying that you look, David's going to take the throne that you could have. Do you not understand that? So therefore, go get him. Bring him to me, because I'm going to kill him. And Jonathan, again, says no. And at this point in time, Saul takes a spear and throws it at his own son. It's easy to be a friend when everything's going well. Imagine Jonathan in that position. He easily could have done what his father said. But he stood firm. You know, I have I have close friendships, and some of those friendships, um, they're ready to encourage me. They're ready to pat me on the back, and they're ready to say things that will that will make me feel good about myself. My ego, even in times when it shouldn't be, uh, which is most of the time. But I also have friends 
who are willing to look me in the eye and say it's not going well. In the fires of adversity, the friendship can be tested. You find out who your true friends are. I've had men in my life to walk into me and say, Mike, you are wrong and you need to repent. They spoke the truth in love. They didn't tell me what I needed to hear, what I wanted to hear. They told me what I needed to hear. And in doing so, they risk the alienation of a friend. You go to a friend and tell him he's wrong and he may get angry. He may get defensive. He may tell you to back off, shut up. This is none of your business. Do you, would you rather have a friend who cares about you or a friend who you're taking care of in a time of need? Because it's hard to tell the truth in love. It's hard to speak the truth in love. It's also hard to receive the truth in love. It hits the ego. When you think you're okay and some friend comes to you and says, you're, you're out of line. I've heard some things you're doing and I really think you need to reconsider it. Not standing in judgment, but I've been told what I needed to hear. And how do I respond? When a friend comes to me with a warning that I don't want to hear. If that friend is a true friend, and I've known that for a long time, then I know they mean me no harm. I should recognize the fact he cared enough to take the risk of bringing it to my attention. He may not be right. It, there may be something more to the story. So I go to a friend of mine and I say, I saw you at lunch with a, a lady the other day. I want to make sure everything's going on between you and your wife. And the answer may be something simple. Maybe something I misperceived. Oh no, that was that was my cousin, or that was, uh, in my case, it happened with my daughter at one point in time. Somebody said something about the way I hugged this girl, and I said, you know, that is my little girl. Um, but it also may be right. And you look at him and say, wait a minute, I realize how that looked. I don't really have an answer for that. So maybe I need to modify my behavior and reduce the risk. Same thing's true in business dealings, in, in a sales situation where I've got the opportunity to mislead someone, uh, or if I just downright lie about something I'm doing, or if I've started acting in a way that sends up red flags about my behavior for a friend to come to me and say, we really need to talk. Think of it as the check engine light on your automobile. Something may not be wrong with your car, but it's time when that light comes on to take a look. Sometimes it's corrective. Sometimes you need to put your actions on hold, reevaluate your circumstances, review the alternatives, or seek other additional counsel. But also, how do you re respond when the Speaking the truth in love is one of the most difficult things we can do for a Christian brother. And yet it's one of the most loving things we can do. You may be opening the door for a much longer and deeper process than you first expected. When your friend says, I've got a bigger problem than that. But Andrew Murray says the highest proof of true friendship is the intimacy that holds nothing back and admits the friend to share our inmost secrets. I look at my friend and I say, you're I you to walk with me through this. All of us struggle with the flesh. All of us will allow our fears, doubts, and discouragements to challenge our faith. None of us have it all together. We don't have perfect marriages or perfect children. We struggle with anger, pride, sexual sin, honesty, and integrity. We are prone to hypocrisy, lust, and dishonesty. That's every single one of us. Christ calls us to convince, confess our struggles with each other and bear each other's burdens. Most of us carry burdens that are so deep and personal, we dare not take the risk of asking for help. We don't want other people to know that we're not perfect. We don't want to expose our lack of faith, our, our 
struggles, our doubts, our fears, we don't want people to know about those things because we're afraid of the judge, judgmental ears that might be hearing our confession. We fear the loss of respect. But 1 Peter 5 gives us a warning. Satan wants to devour every Christian he can take down. We should be sober-minded and watchful. We should stand and watch for each other. It doesn't matter if you are a mature Christian with a long, with a theology degree, a lifelong missionary, a pastor, a deacon, or a brand new Christian who can't quote John 3.16. It doesn't matter. We all need each other. We all share the same risks, have a responsibility to stand and watch for each other on the spiritual battlefield. Relational accountability is not just a buzzword. It's a way of life. Matthew Henry says, Christians ought to have tender consideration and concern for one another. They should affectionately consider what their several wants, weaknesses, and temptations are. And they should do this not to reproach one another or to provoke one another, not to anger, but to love and good works, calling upon themselves and one another to love God and Christ more, to love duty and holiness more, to love their brethren in Christ more, and to do all the good offices of Christian affection both to the bodies and souls of each other. A good example given to others is the best and most effectual provocation of love and good works. This is one of the more modern day heroes of our military. Um, Luca, you see is missing uh, his leg. Um, Luca was injured protecting someone else. You and I are called to protect each other. We're called to love each other. We're called to be relational. We're called to relational accountability. We're called to be um, able to admit our needs, to seek help. And we're also called to go the distance when one of our brothers does the same for us. Hope you have a blessed week. Um, we'll come back again next week with another lesson. Um, in the meantime, stay strong, stay healthy, and uh, we'll ask God to protect and guide us through the rest of the week. Thank you.